From the Sumire Foundation and Connor B. Judge Foundation, this is Demystifying NMO. With support from Genentech. Welcome back to Demystifying NMO. I'm your host, Chelsea Judge. I hope you enjoyed our last episode, which was on the NMO SD diagnosis, where we went over the clinical parameters and standards, the international diagnostic criteria for NMO SD with clinician and patient Dr. Robles. And now we're going to walk into part two of that, which is okay, you have the NMO SD diagnosis. Now what? What does that look like once you've had this traumatic, severe diagnosis put on you, really? What does that look like to move forward, to manage it with this lifelong illness or this lifelong condition? I am honored, privileged, um, elated to share the conversation that I had with another NMOSD patient and advocate, Taylor Ann Macy. Taylor is a certified life coach and mother. She graduated from Brigham Young University, and now she works while balancing a motherhood and wifedom and, and of course, living with NMOSD with speaking out about her experiences and controlling what you can. So really a focus you know, on the buzzword of wellness, but more, I would say, lifestyle management, controlling what you can, um, which can include diet, exercising, and of course, a focus and appreciation for mental health as well. So I had a lovely conversation with Taylor that I'm really excited to share with you, and I hope that it really does relate to others who are going through a traumatic diagnosis um, of the now what, of, of what you can do to move forward, controlling what you can, of course, including a really an integrative approach. So meeting with your clinical care team, making informed shared decisions with your neurologist, your neuroimmunologist, and then doing what you can on your own on the individual level. Nothing too extreme, nothing too crazy, just controlling what you can to have a really well-balanced mind-body connection and approach to move forward with the NMOSD diagnosis. So let's get into it. Hi, Taylor. Thank you so much for joining with us today. I really appreciate having you on the pod to talk about your experiences in living with NMO after the diagnosis. Oh, thank you so much. I am really, really thrilled to be here. I find that connecting in the NMO SD community and having as much information as possible is one of the best things that we can do for ourselves. So I am really, really happy to be here. Absolutely. And when we had chatted a little bit previously, I really liked a lot of the key phrases or way that you um, express things. So this is really a topic where it's kind of more about integrative health. So we have focused so much on clinical um, visits and treatments for acute NMOSD relapses and preventing them and, you know, managing everything with shared decisions with clinical uh, your clinical care team. But something that you said that stuck with me was no doctor has all the answers. This is a unique disease for each person and I think really reflects how each patient with their clinical care team, with their family, with their friends, really has to navigate this in a unique way. Yes, and that's why I think it's really important to utilize the information and the resources that you have with your clinical team, but then also to look at the other factors that contribute to health. Um, nutrition, what you feed your body and how you move your body have a drastic impact on your health. And it also has a drastic impact on disease. Now, of course, I am not here saying that, you know, eating more vegetables is going to solve something like NMOSD. However, I do believe that it can help in a way. And so I think it's vital for any person that has encountered this disease in any way that they put at least some measure of effort in the area of the fitness and nutrition and the mental health, in addition to the clinical team that you have supporting you. Exactly. In addition, this is not an either or thing. It is an altogether thing. You do your preventative medicine, you work with your clinical care team, you do the lifestyle or modifiable factors, right? Control what you can. Maybe let's back it up a little bit because I'd really like to hear with whatever you're willing to share about your journey through NMO, what that diagnosis process was like for you, and then how that was impacted by your background, um, having educational background in fitness and nutrition. I am so happy to share it all. So I was initially diagnosed with NMOSD in October of 2019. And how it all happened for me is I had a cold at the time. I have no previous history of any type of chronic illness or any type of autoimmune disease. And 
So this was really out of left field for me, but I had a cold and I started to notice something a little bit funny with my eyes. And, you know, I later learned that they just weren't quite tracking, but it wasn't, I just thought it was congestion or, you know, nothing important. And then one day I woke up and I couldn't stand up straight because my eyes were so completely disconnected and it was entirely physically and mentally discombobulating because I couldn't stand up, which is very contrary to how I normally physically behave in a day. And so I was really shaken by it and I didn't know what to do, right? When you have a symptom like that, what do you do? And so it was a whirlwind of appointments, meeting with neuro-ophthalmologists, getting those MRIs done. And eventually I met with who is now my neuro-ophthalmologist. And she, of course, was like, listen, I can't actually give you a diagnosis, but this does look similar to MS. So we are referring you to a specialist. And I got the referral and the appointment was like six to eight months away. It was a long time. I think it was like in April or May. And so I was trying to make peace with this idea of MS. And I had a friend from high school who is a medical assistant to a neurologist near me. Our moms are friends and they were talking about it. And it just, again, kind of snowballed where he was like, can I see your scans? He said, can I take your scans to my doctor? I just feel like something seems a little bit off here. And, you know, kudos to him for having intuition. It's just a medical assistant, right? He was so brilliant and I love him forever. But he took the scans to this neurologist and I got a call that said, can you come in tomorrow? Like before we open the office, I need to see you tomorrow. This was someone that I'd never met and was so willing to see me based on what he had seen in these scans. And so it was that next day that I got this diagnosis. And I think I was receiving my first treatment, you know, a few weeks later. I've heard a lot of NMOSD stories and they just range. They're all obviously dramatic, like one of these like unbelievable stories. But I want to pause because, yeah, that is also uniquely, well, traumatic and also dramatic, right? Um, and, and, and the fact that NMOSD patients always, quote, feel lucky uh, mm-hmm. by a quick or swift diagnosis that's based off of connections in some way, where obviously everyone should be that, quote, lucky if you're going to get you know, a traumatic um, disease like this. So just pausing for that and validating the valid. Wow. So how did just, that's a whirlwind. And then how, um, at that time, I know you're a, a mama now, were you a mom at the time? Like, just how did you as a person cope with that? Right. We heard the clinical, we know how it was diagnosed, mm-hmm. but like, how did you as a person cope? Well, you know, it was really interesting because I don't think I've ever felt so much helplessness. Because even still, it was like, okay, well, for a day or two, I thought it was MS. And then, you know, now I've got this weird thing I've never heard of. And now they're saying it's a chemotherapy infusion regularly. That Like, it was all these things where I was, like, so completely disoriented and felt like I had nowhere to ground myself. Um, At the time, my son was three and my daughter was seven months old. And I remember I had, they had put me on an IV of steroids for a couple of days. And I remember, like, right before I had gotten the IV, I was sitting at the table breastfeeding my seven month old and being like, this is the last time I'm going to do this. I planned to for a year and sitting at the table, just in tears being like, well, this is the last time I'm going to do this because I'm going to have to be on this. I mean, and we could have figured it out, but there was just so much going on where it was like, it's just too hard. And so it, I just remember thinking, I don't know where to land here. And so for me, that's where it was like, I don't have any answers. And I, I did have some, but it still just felt like I had no idea what was going on really. And so I had to just return to what I knew, which was, okay, how can I nourish my body today? How can I move my body while I can? How can I talk to someone and be able to process all of these emotions and thoughts that I'm having? How can I take care of myself in the best way that I know how to when everything else is really out of my hands? Wow. Um, when the, what another thing that really struck with me that you said was about just like when you first get the diagnosis, right, there's like all this chaos going around you. And my husband, when he was diagnosed with MS, he was saying how everything else after what the doctor said, it was like from Charlie Brown, the peanuts, like, wah, 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 like, like that, like nothing else mattered. And he was like in a black hole, like, because your life changes like that. And your identity changes all of this. I, and so I think it's amazing and inspiring and also really powerful that you were able to be like, no, I realize this is all chaos, but I'm going to control what I can. I mean, wow, that you had such like a healthy response to that. I'm sure, you know, nothing is li- that linear and it's not that clean, but right. still that's yeah. it really wasn't that linear for sure. And there were moments of just feeling completely lost. And I remember after my husband and I just sat in the car and sobbed and I've never seen him cry like that. And it was just like our whole life seemed like it was 
completely flipped on its head. And so, um, you know, there was a lot of that too, but I think that that was where the getting help part was so crucial because I could be that. I had space to be hopeless. I had space to be devastated. I had space to feel all those things in a constructive way and not feel like it, all of those emotions and thoughts were going to kill me, right? It's yes. like, okay, I can develop the skills for how to feel these feelings. I can develop the skills for how to manage this. Um, I think that was completely crucial for me. Oh, I love it. I mean, and not just people who are navigating scary diagnoses like MS or NMO, but even when you just have like another horrible event happen in your life, people who are going through divorces or um, just any turbulent time. Someone close to me when she was going through a divorce, she's like, I just didn't want to have a heart attack. I just, so I went to the gym. I did what I could because I just didn't want to have a heart attack. So I think that it's really empowering what, you, what you're doing and like another like a healthy release for all of the like really intense, stressful feelings. So what did that look like for you? I could understand where like it would look a little bit different for each person based off of uh, potential like disability. What does that look like for you? Well, I definitely have become a lot more present where it is just like I have today, I can still walk today. And so I did my best to really make that a priority after I got the diagnosis. And I actually got really into CrossFit and it was like, okay, these are, you know, crazy challenging things I've never done before. And I, if I have today to do them, I want to try, I want to prove to myself that I'm more capable than I believe. And you know, of course, with every person with this diagnosis, there are physical limitations based on every individual symptoms. And so it's not like I can just say, well, go work out more. But again, coming back to the idea of controlling what you can, if you are able, at least in my mind, that was how I approached it. And so I have been able to, you know, really get stronger than I've ever been before in the last two years and do all of these things I never thought possible just because I've taken it day by day and saying, this is what I have. I'm going to really see what it is that I can do. And it was interesting because at one of my appointments last year with my clinical team, they were looking at my scans and, you know, we were doing the tests, the walking and the touching the nose, all the things. And, and they were a little bit baffled and they're like, you're telling me that you're still able to walk. And I said, yeah, no, I, not only can I walk, I can still do a lot of other things at CrossFit. And they said, you have the scans of a paralyzed person. The fact that you're walking is, is unbelievable. Right. And so to hear that is both like, wait, that's amazing, but also what? Terrifying. Yeah. Right. Oh my gosh. Okay. Wow. So much to reflect on here. So I'm a scientist by background, and so I'm motivated heavily by data. I love hearing amazing stories, and then I'm like, how is that working? Is that, you know? And back to the point of, like, integrative medicine, do all of the things that you can control that you know is going to keep your disease at bay or as low as possible, right? Meeting with your doctor, getting that preventative medicine, um, et cetera, et cetera. And also this exercise. Like, there's really overall, like, compelling data on the benefits of exercise, movement. I mean, it does not have to be anything crazy, but improving physical disability, lots of data in MS, in basically curbing disease, helping you manage and cope in an individualized way, and also benefits to your cognitive health as well, which can be impacted by these kinds of diseases. So it's it's really intuitive. And also it's backed up by the science, which of course, I mean, that's the best science. I think it's important to note as well that health doesn't only come from something extreme like CrossFit. Our bodies are meant to move. They are meant to walk. They are meant to, you know, get that blood flow going. And so regardless of whatever the movement is, just being able to integrate that into your life immediately jumpstarts your health and your nutrition without having to do anything wild. But anyway, I, I'm very, very passionate about that as well. because I, I can hear it. it in your voice. I love it. <laughs> you've related so much as like knowing yourself well enough. Like, you know, sometimes I think you said before last time we chatted, caring for yourself in a mindful fashion. I like how you put that. And I think so much of that is so important for NMO patients because the, this concept of spoonie theory or spoon theory that patients with chronic diseases like NMO, they have a finite number of energy units, which are spoons, while someone without a chronic illness has an infinite number of spoons. And But if you have a finite number, you need to be really mindful of what you're doing. And I and while exercise, movement, long-term, amazing benefits for overall health, you know, it can seem counterintuitive in the moment when you're feeling very fatigued or you don't have any spoons left to just like, to just say, no, not today. Um, What are your thoughts on that and managing it? Because it can be it can be difficult for the healthiest of us, let alone people managing NMO. Absolutely. Well, and 
we do have a finite number of spoons of mental energy units in a day. That's why we have to sleep at night to replenish all of those. And no one knows you better than you. And no one knows your body better than you. I mean, you could have a clinical team that knows a lot of the like scientific pieces of what's happening there, but no one can really know what's happening better than you. And so that's why it's important that number one, you have to be your own best advocate. And whether that means speaking up to your clinical team about something, but also listening to your body in terms of what it needs. I like to, a lot of times with when you have a lot of emotions coming up around this, whether it's you know specific to something or just in general worry, anxiety, those emotions can take up a lot of mental energy. Worrying about things and feeling um, upset about things can take up a lot of mental energy. And so that's why I am such an advocate for having a therapist, having a coach that you can go to work out how to not waste energy units on all of those emotions and be able to reserve those other ones for what you want them for. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I hear what you're saying. So I think this is like a really good transition too. So after your NMO diagnosis and like just really going through that process of up people, which mm -hmm. it forces, try to take back some control, some power with making sure decisions with your clinical care team were move, moving. And it also sounds like mental health is a big passion and focus area for you too. So also seeing a therapist was essential. Is that a good word um, for coping? That's a great word. Yeah. Well, and especially because our team generally isn't available 24 seven and perhaps the way we might need. Of course, like there are amazing doctors that are giving us as much of their time as they can. But sometimes there's are things happening for us that we don't have the immediate clinical team there for. And so that's why, at least the emotional piece. And so that's why having a therapist regularly, like there was a time where I was getting coached. I had a coach and a therapist at the time every single day. And so for me, that was what I needed, right? Because nothing was really changing with my body. Things were just moving along at whatever speed that they had to. And I was waiting on insurance approval and all the things. And so everything that I was dealing with required a lot of attention that clinical team couldn't quite provide. And so knowing that I had a space to parse it out and solve and develop skills for made everything so much easier. Oh, I mean, I completely agree that I can tout the benefits of therapy. How did you find a therapist? I think for some people who have, are new to therapy might be a little bit overwhelmed as all NMO patients can understand just by the healthcare system period is overwhelming. Do you have any tips or suggestions for people just getting into therapy? Well, when I had gotten in, I um, my brother-in-law is a therapist. He owns a practice. So it was relatively easy for me to be able to find someone that I trusted because I knew he trusted this person. But I also used Talkspace for a while to be able to have text interaction with a therapist. It's an app where you can have, that sometimes is covered by insurance, where you can have interaction there. It's different in each state how you can find therapists, but um, references from other people and also just Googling like therapists in my city, it there's a lot that comes up that at least gives you options to go through and perhaps call and find out more about. I also like to give people permission to try as many therapists or coaches as they need before they find one that they love, that they really resonate with. It's such a work that's worthwhile because you want that person to jive with you and you want that person to be your safe space. And sometimes you just don't match with people and that doesn't mean anything's wrong, but you just have to keep searching to find those people because it's for your own benefit. Oh, I love that you say that, like shop around for a good therapist. Yeah. Like people shop around for like a good blender. <laughs> shop around okay. for, right. For someone who you're going to tell like your, I mean, I mean, like theoretically your soul to. Yeah. I've heard some people have recommended, like you said, Google psychology today and to find one that fits for you. And there's also just like a lot of different types of therapists. Like my therapist mm -hmm. is a social worker by background. So an LSW social worker. I know there's PsyDs, PhDs, MDs. Right. A lot of times you can get in with a single therapist. And even if you're like, you know what, I don't feel like this is good, but what do you recommend? This is more of what I'm looking like looking for, excuse me, when you can look at a therapist and use them as a resource to say, hey, I think you're great. And also I feel like I need more support in this area. Do you have any recommendations where I can go? Oh, just like when you go to the doctor, you go to a neurologist for NMO, and then you go to like an OBGYN mm -hmm. to have a baby, et cetera. There's like different mm -hmm. types. Mm -hmm. Because we're focusing kind of on a topic of wellness and there's so much misinformation specifically, I mean, everywhere, but also specifically within the wellness space. Do you have any recommend recommendations for other NMOSD patients, MS patients for like cutting through the noise and the misinformation on the internet? That's a good question. I feel like I've done that for myself in a way. I think that cutting through the misinformation is just about finding people that you trust and finding people that make you feel good. 
If there is information out there that makes you feel terrible, it's probably not helpful to spend any more time looking into it. And can you elaborate that on like the makes you feel terrible? Yes, there is a lot of information in the quote unquote health world that makes you feel like you're doing something wrong with the way you're approaching your health. That makes you feel like there is something that you are missing. Thus, you are less than because maybe you don't know about this trick or this way to eat or this way to exercise. And the honest truth is that there aren't really any secrets about health. People just like to pretend that there are as a way of selling something. That's why when you can find people that you trust, that are transparent, that share things that uplift you and that make you feel like you are doing the great job that you are doing, then it makes it easier to not let your brain go to that doomsday space. Because I think that's what can happen is you see like, oh, I need to do more of this. I'm not doing enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not healthy enough. Um, And again, that's where having a coach... Uh, in this realm can be extremely helpful just to constrain your focus on on tuning out all of the noise that can be prevalent in the health industry. I really love what you said. Obviously, there's a level of personal autonomy and accountability, and that's empowering. But the other side of that is like pathological. Yeah, because I've gone through, you know, my Instagram or even just Google and I unfollow, I delete things that are not in alignment with what feels the best to me. And so the idea that any of us are at fault for our disease, like even if you could find truth in that, it feels terrible to think that. Do what you can, but always come from a place of um, compassion. It's about empowering others to make better decisions for themselves versus the shame and blame or the fear mongering tactic. Like for me, when I'm on social media and trying to sift through it, I'm like, okay, what is the logic here? And if it's the logic that I have like a failing or that I should be scared of something, then they're probably trying to just sell me something. And I am not in the mood for that versus here is just a trusted health institution, health official, clinician, scientist, verified information. And here's what you could do with it. And I think that's so important. And I mean, that's one of the things that we do have control over is what we put in front of our brains to have thoughts about. And so if you are constantly looking at people that just post like pictures of their half naked bodies, and and I I mean, that's fine. Like, but it's like, it's going to make you feel bad. We'll, we will have a lot of the same thoughts that maybe we're doing something wrong. Maybe we're not doing enough and that we don't deserve that. We deserve to give ourselves all the best things to have thoughts about. We've covered a lot, right, You of how you kind of manage and cope living with NMO, which I think is like a beautiful model where obviously you have like your clinical care team and you take your preventative medicine and you focus on your individual um, lifestyle factors of exercise, your relationship sounds solid, working on your mental health. All of that is so important for your best long-term outcome. And obviously that comes with a lot of work and I know it's very gritty on the inside. What would you tell yourself when you were first getting diagnosed now? Like, you know what I mean? What do you know now that you wish you had known then? Yeah. Well, honestly, in retrospect, I would say I'm very proud of how I handled it in that moment Um, and in the subsequent moments, obviously. But here's what I would tell myself. In that moment, I, my mind ran to the future. It ran to worst case scenario. It ran to all of the worst things, you know, having orphaned children, like all all these horrible ideas of what could happen. But in that moment, even with the diagnosis and even with the symptoms, everything was okay. I was still there. I was still alive and I was okay. And so going back, I would tell myself to just be there because telling a story about the future that we don't know yet is pointless because we don't really know what's going to happen. And so to really just rein yourself back into right now, here's what I can see. Here's what I can feel. Here's what I can smell. And we're okay. I think that's probably the advice that I would give myself is just to recognize that it wasn't the worst case scenario then, and it still isn't. And it might be, but there's no upside in dwelling on what it might be. I'm going to try to remind myself of that. That was really poignant and beautiful. Taylor, I love talking with you so much. I really appreciate your time and all of your insights. Truly, thank you. I am so grateful I got to chat with you today. And yeah, thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm.